Hi everyone, I'm Ran, a machine learning engineering team lead at Wix. And I want to share with you today our journey over the last year, year and a half, uh, defining, designing and building what we now call an ML platform. First agenda, I'll give a short intro of the data science group at Wix and some of the use cases in which we use machine learning models for. Uh, go over the motivation and vision behind building such a platform. Then a high level overview of the main user flows, general architecture and, um, and main components. Then do a bit more of a deep dive into two of the more, uh, most interesting components, uh, I think, which is the CI CD pipeline and the feature store, which is really uh, the cornerstone of our platform. So the data science group at Wix is based in three locations. Uh, two of them are in uh, Ukraine and one in Israel here in Tel Aviv. And it's comprised of approximately 25 data scientists, uh, 10 data software engineers, depending on how you define the term, and 20 data curators, which are a team responsible uh, for data labeling procedures and data QA, mainly for image data. And Wix is a very broad company, uh, and as such, there's a variety of use cases uh, for which we use machine learning and AI methods uh, in production for. And let's go over some of them. First, premium and churn prediction, two of our most uh, obvious models in, in some sense, since Wix is a freemium-based company. So we are trying to detect, uh, as accurately as possible of course, whether a, a user is going to upgrade to premium, or, or, or if he's already premium, uh, whether he's going to churn. And then we can use these insights uh, for uh, many uh, treatments, for many use cases, like uh, proactively contacting a user if you recognize that he's uh, about to churn, proactively calling him, sending him an email, trying to uh, walk him through the site. Support article recommendation. Uh, Wix's uh, support organization is very big. Uh, we have approximately 1,000 support agents currently uh, working at Wix, and uh, they are maintaining something around 10,000 support articles uh, aimed for users to help them better build their site. And the group contribution in that area is building a recommendation engine uh, aimed to find aim to help users find the most uh, relevant support article based on their uh, query, based on their query terms. Local beauty ranking, one of the, the coolest ML projects done here, I think. Uh, Wix is a logo maker product. Given some initial set of preferences by the user, uh, the engine renders a list of logos. As you can see here, we're trying to create a logo for Tori and Troy. It's apparently uh, the best pizza place in Tel Aviv. And the ranking of the logos, meaning which logos will be presented first to the user, is done by a, a logo beauty ranking model, external logo beauty ranking model, trained specifically on Wix uh, generated logos based on crowdsourcing input and designers. Super interesting. Template semantic search. Um, usually, users uh, don't start from, from a blank page, don't start from scratch. Uh, we have hundreds of initial site templates to get you started uh, up running fast with your sites. And we added a semantic search layer uh, to the template search. So if you don't find exactly uh, uh, the template that fits your needs, maybe something around that area, maybe something semantically close. Okay, if you're looking for a template around uh, risotto, so the search term, so the search results will also bring you uh, templates that are related to pasta. A very cool suite of computer vision based uh, uh, models which use uh, deep learning methods. Say you have an e-commerce site, Wix is also, uh, in, has e-commerce uh, sites you can build with it. You have an e-commerce site and you want to upload photos of your products to the site. Very reasonable thing to do. So using this uh, suite of tools, you don't need to go to a special design studio or hire a photographer for that. You can take just uh, photos of your products using your phones, and these models take care of cropping out the background, enhancing the image's resolution, and in general doing all kinds of image manipulations to, to make your products look good on the site. So we briefly went through almost all of the models in this slide, and what's my point? Uh, as you witnessed, we have a very wide range of model types we need to support in production. Classification, regression, ranking, recommendation, deep learning, and much, much more. Most of our models, if not all of them, require specific, uh, specific training resources, tailor-made feature extraction processes, and different deployment methodologies. And the truth is that building ML-based systems is hard. They're hard to build, they're hard to maintain, and they're hard to monitor. 
This is one of my uh, favorite figures around that area, really uh, ubiquitous in every 101 ML engineering slide deck, taken from a Google paper called Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. Very, very good read if you're not familiar with it. And the key phrase is this, only a small fraction of real-world ML systems is composed, uh, is composed of the ML code and shown by the small black box in the middle. The required surrounding infrastructure is vast and complex. And what is the problem depicted here, especially uh, for us? Given the scope and broadness of the problems of the models we have to support in production, we can't afford to re-implement every one uh, of these boxes for each and every model. So the challenge or the idea is how do we generalize this set of boxes into a coherent set of components or a platform that will enable us to support most, if not all, of our models in production. And if you break it down into steps, we want to build a single platform that will address the entire end-to-end -end machine learning workflow, which means managing data, training and evaluating models, deploying model instances, serving predictions, and monitoring features and predictions. The one-liner, the, the vision of our platform, is to allow data scientists and analysts at Wix to build, deploy, maintain, and monitor machine learning models in production with minimal engineering efforts. There's a very large emphasis on my part on minimal engineering efforts. I, as an ML platform engineer in that sense, I want to build the infrastructure, tools, and methodologies for the data scientist to complete the entire life cycle by himself. In some sense, I don't want to be involved in every model going to production. If a data scientist managed to get his model from inception to production, and I had no idea about that, then I did my job right. I did something right. This is how we, we look at it. So now that uh, hopefully uh, the motivation and vision are better understood, let's go over a high level overview of the, comp of the, build, the platform. As always, we start with data. The data management part of our platform uh, is what we call the feature store, uh, a term I'll dive much more deeper into. The general idea is how do we uh, formalize, how do we define the notion uh, of an ML feature that can be used uh, both for training and for serving, and to allow feature reuse between different projects that we have here at Wix. Next up is model build. Internally, uh, the system uses MLflow, which I'll show you how. Um, is an abstraction layer for a model repository and CI systems, and a CI system. ML projects managed via the platform should follow a certain structure, uh, very similar to what Daniel just showed us. And we'll circle back to this, but the important detail here is the model PY file uh, that should, incl should include a class inheriting from our uh, base Wix model. This is the, the high level interface that all models deployed uh, via the platform should adhere to, should implement. And on build time, while doing the CI, what we call the CI, we invoke three methods. First, schema. Schema method, which describes the model schema, meaning which input features it should get and the output prediction fields it produces. Second, get training data, which is responsible for fetching uh, the training data and returning it as a pandas data frame which the system later, later stores aside for two things. One, reproducibility. As you probably all know, if you want to reproduce a model instance or a model build, we can't just have the code. We also need the data. So this is the data segment. But second is a baseline for concept detection, meaning detecting over time the shift or the change of the statistical properties of the features we are getting in production. Uh, versus what we originally trained on, versus what the model was originally trained on, which is the baseline, what we see here. And third, fit, a rather uh, familiar interface, uh, I would assume, responsible for fitting or training the model. So once a data scientist pushes their code uh, or invokes the platform build API, uh, we kick off the CI process. Uh, the CI process in our high-level overview context means uh, basically two things. First and foremost, training. Training is done on the central CI system, not on the data scientist uh, local machine, nor on some remote machine he set up. All models that are candidates for production are, are trained centrally on the CI system where the process is visible, and most importantly, can be reproduced. 
Second thing the CI is responsible for is serialization. Uh, we use MLflow flavor mechanism. Daniel just uh, showed us a few clicks, a few uh, points of. Uh, to log and store the model to uh, the model repository, to MLflow, which is in our case just an S3 bucket. One level above MLflow, we have our management console, our in-house management console, which is the, the central place for data scientists to manage their features, data sets, and models. And model instances or model builds are deployed via a UI or an API to AWS SageMaker. SageMaker uh, is the managed service, the, man uh, the managed service we use as a model hosting solution. I'll show you what this uh, brings us in a bit. So once an endpoint is created or updated on SageMaker, we register the new build, the new model instance at a component we call the predictor, the prediction service, uh, which acts as a gateway uh, to the model deployed, uh, to de deployed on SageMaker. I like to think about it as the API gateway for ML models uh, managed via the platform. Having a centralized uh, serving components gives us a few very strong benefits. First, an API layer, uh, having a closed set of APIs for all of our models. Uh, Wix is an API-first company, uh, and this API, along with all others, is modeled in protobuf, with a prediction service uh, exposing gRPC and REST endpoints serving it. So production services, other production services at Wix can easily consume it. So the first task of this proxy server is to do the translation of the world of developers, meaning uh, typed protobuf APIs, gRPC, and rest, to the data scientist domain. In our case, a, a pandas data frame. The prediction service eventually invokes the predict function, and its job is to supply x, the feature vector, from the outside. Like what we see here, the model on SageMaker, is the last stop. Is the last stop. Features shouldn't be extracted from here. Okay? We don't want data scientists to handle the feature extraction logic in, in their code. Okay? This is something we want to pass on to the platform, and I'll show you uh, what this means. Second advantage we're getting from a centralized, centralized uh, serving component is tracking the health metrics, uh, the health metrics for each model using a standardized metric collection system implemented by the predictor and enriched with SageMaker CloudWatch metrics. In the dashboard I'll show you in a bit. Third, feature extraction. Here we see uh, the, off, the online feature store, counterpart of the offline feature store, of course, and the piece that is responsible for generating the, the feature vector X that will be passed on to the model in the serving flow. And last, fourth, standardization of features and prediction logging for the intent of building automatic dashboards and alerts which track various performance-related metrics of the model, whether they are generic, uh, like uh, training serving skew or concept drift, or can be specific if a data scientist chooses to build his Tableau reports uh, on that. So a data scientist that deploys their model uh, to our platform gets for free, one, an API layer, two, automatic health dashboard, three, feature extraction, and four, standardized features and predictions logging. So the first component, or more actually a flow I'd like to present, is the CI-CD. And when we think of a, of a CI-CD uh, pipeline uh, for ML projects, what are the key uh, properties or components uh, that we need? We can think of many. Uh, Martin Fowler has a very comprehensive uh, article around that. But let's try to focus on three. First, reproducible model training. We want to have the ability to fully reproduce, or reproduce as accurately as, as possible, the model instance, which means in the ML code use case, not keeping track not just of the code, but also of the data and the parameters which rendered it. Second, experiments tracking, uh, which includes model metrics. We need a system that will enable uh, that will enable us to capture and display model metrics in a way that will allow humans and automated processes to decide if and which models should be promoted to production. And once we orchestrated uh, the, training, uh, the training pipeline, we want to have a standard mechanism for model deployment and serving. So if you look at this diagram, I think we can roughly divide the first two points uh, to CI, next one to uh, CD, to continuous delivery. 
And the continuous integration uh, part of our system is covered by MLflow, specifically the MLflow projects component, which is defined as a file format for packaging data science code in a reusable and reproducible way based primarily on conventions. We facilitated or model our ML build system around the component. And let's see how it works. Going back to the directory structure, we now have an ML project file, which I like to think about in this context as a build file, like a POM XML for some Java-based artifacts or a set PY for Python modules. And this is kind of a pseudocode uh, version of our standard uh, ML project we use here at Wix, uh, the YAML file. This YAML file has two entry points, build and test. And the build command is the important detail here. It invokes this uh, black magic function, build model, okay, which, which is the real trick. That's the real heavy lifting. Okay? And let's go over it. So we're a bit simplifying things here, of course. Um, well, uh, inevitably, our production code is a bit more verbose. It bears the exact same spirit. The function takes two arguments. First, the, initial, the initialized model instance, uh, the one inheriting from our base Wix model. Second, the production directory. Uh, which by convention contains all of our code dependencies, meaning code files that should be uh, sent to production, to SageMaker, alongside the model. We first uh, get the training data, fetch and store the training data, as we said, A for reproducibility, B for concept drift detection. Then we feed the method, train the method, usually the most time-consuming phase uh, of the pipeline. Then we register the schema, we associate the schema of the model to its build ID. So once we have the model in production, we have full visibility of its interface, meaning which input features it should get and output prediction field it produces, because these things can vary from deployment to deployment. But most importantly, this is an integral part of our uh, feature, automatic feature extraction process. I'll touch later on in the feature store segment. And finally, we log the model to MLflow. This is the phase where MLflow takes care of the serialization and model storage for us. So data scientists won't have to dirty their code with the random pickle load, pickle dump statements. And the ML platform via MLflow abstracts that uh, completely away from them. And by using MLflow CLI, these conventions facilitate a rather a neat or clean interface software developers are, are fairly accustomed to build and test commands. And the CI process runs these commands exactly. Data scientists are free, more than that, are encouraged to run these commands from their local machine, thus guaranteeing that the same model will run both on their local and on CI. Now that we have an model, meaning a logged, fitted, and serialized model, we can deploy to SageMaker easily deploy to SageMaker. This is the, the continuous delivery part of our, seg of our uh, pipeline. And what are the advantages we are getting from SageMaker? First, MLflow plays very well with it, enabling us a one-click deployment of MLflow based to SageMaker. Second, auto-scaling policies uh, for deployed models based on throughput, latency, hardware utilization, and more. Third, we can choose uh, hardware types, specific hardware types, optimized for ML workloads, for inference workloads. And fourth, we uh, use the standard CloudWatch metrics uh, system and stream the logs into our own templated Grafana dashboards per model, which look like this. This is our management console, uh, ML platform. So we see here the support article recommendation, which is currently uh, deployed. You see it online on two ML2 large instances. And in the middle, we have the health dashboard, health metrics. From left to right, uh, RPM, requests per minute, median response, CPU, disk, memory, throughput. Of course, these things are not, data scientist doesn't uh, create them each time from scratch. They are created automatically uh, when a data scientist deploys his model via the platform. Moving on to the build tab. We have uh, the list of build IDs. In our case, two specific, uh, two uh, successful builds. And for every build, we have the git commit which triggered the model, or, or, in, the, or in case the model was triggered by an API, uh, the git commit the model was based on. And for successful builds, on the right side, you have the deploy button, deploy screen, which pops up this screen. 
where you can choose uh, the instance type your model uh, will run on. You have C available types, which is a link that just refers you uh, to AWS SageMaker in inference page. And you can choose the initial number of instances your model will be deployed on. Again, we have auto-scaling, but you can choose the uh, initial number of instances. Cool. Second component I'd like to elaborate and, de and dive much more deeper into is the feature store. Uh, is, in other senses, the cornerstone of our platform. And what's the problem we try to solve uh, using this feature store? We started to observe that in some of our most important models, li like premium and churn, every time there's a new iteration or effort around them, the project starts from scratch, especially in the feature gathering, the feature engineering part. And, and why is that? Well, we started to observe that in a lot of the cases, uh, the SQLs, the patterns of ad hoc SQLs generated uh, for each data set are either non-existent, we see the data sets, but we have no idea how it was created. We don't see the SQL lost in time. Or non-reproducible, we, uh, we see the data set and the SQL that generated it, uh, but the tables might have dropped, like the underlying tables might have dropped, or their schema so we have no uh, way to produce the data set on a different population. So the first thing we set out to solve, uh, so the first thing we want to do is create a single curated discoverable source of truth for features to be used by models. Second thing we wanted to do is to allow data scientists and analysts to share features between projects. Let's say I have a feature, how many times did the user publish his site over the last month? Again, how many times did the user Wix user published uh, changes on his site. This is what Wix users do. They change something in the editor. They publish their changes to make them available online. How many times did the user publish his site over the last month? And this is an engagement feature, trying to measure uh, how much is the user engaged with one of the basic properties uh, we have here at Wix. And say I want to calculate this feature on a premium user. And I see that he hasn't made any publishes at all. There can be many reasons, but maybe he's not a very engaged user. Maybe he's, he can leave me, he can churn. And if I'm trying to calculate this feature on a free user, and I see that he, he published the changes of, of his site multiple times, hundreds of times over the last month. So it sounds like a very engaged user. Maybe there's a, a high probability that he's going to upgrade to premium. And, and these are not made up examples. We see uh, these types of feature sharing uh, today, specifically in churn and premium prediction. And last but not least, uh, we want to build a system that will systematically ensure the matching between offline and online generated features. Engineering-wise, the hardest problem. And the main notion behind our feature store is what we call declarative feature engineering. We have a pre-configured set of feature families uh, supported, both, uh, supported both for online and offline for users and sites. And we, rough, and, and we roughly divide the, those feature families to two, uh, event-based and non-event-based. And by event-based, I mean uh, user interactions, a click stream. Like user pressed this component, pressed that component, pressed this component, pressed that component, uh, saved this site, uh, published this site, logged in. These are what I uh, refer to as click stream events. So the first fe feature family we support is aggregations doing some average count and duration over time windows, like how many times did the user publish his site. Second feature family we support is categorical, which means the name is a bit misleading. It just says taking specific fields uh, from user interaction for those clickstream events. Like if they have the user's uh, registration event, so take the browser family or the country code. And the third feature family we support, which is non-event based and thus much harder, is site content meaning features that are based uh, on the site content itself and structure. Things like number of components, uh, number of text components in a site, number of images, dominant language, uh, and much, much more. So I want to show you uh, two examples of creating a feature using our feature store. The first feature we're going to create is count published site over the last month, what we just discussed. How many times did the user published one of his changes over the last month? Second feature is days since site was last saved. How long since the site was last saved? In days. This is how it looks like. This is the add new feature screen from the three-phased process. And we start with the metadata. 
first uh, the entity the feature refers to, in our case a user. We have uh, the display name, what's the feature, how's the feature called, can't publish site uh, over the last month, its description and area, meaning, uh, roughly meaning the business unit the feature is referring to. Next up we have the events, uh, we're choosing the clickstream events that the feature will be based on. In our case we're choosing a KPI, uh, which is just a collection of events. We're choosing edit or publish site, which gives us uh, this event with this set of filters from Wix's event catalog. Uh, very cool project, but for a different session. And then we choose the measure. In this time we're choosing, uh, this we're choosing a measure uh, aggregation of type count. And the interesting part is how do we model over the last month, or in our case over the last uh, 30 days. So we chose using a time anchor. Time anchor we call the prediction point. So we're doing prediction point minus 30 days up until prediction point. And I'll show you how this prediction point is being used. Let's do uh, another one quickly. Again, day since site was last saved. This is what we are doing. Again, a metadata. This time I'm doing it on a site level. Feature is based on a site. We're giving it uh, a name, description, and the area. Again, editor business unit, editor of Wix. This time we're choosing just one event, editor save site, again from Wix's event catalog. And choosing the measure, again uh, aggregation, but this time of type duration and time unit days. And we're doing from a, a last editor save site. I have two options here, from first save site or last save site. So I want to do days since site was last saved, so I model from last editor save site up until prediction point. The feature store has two legs, a training and serving feature creation. In the training flow, uh, in order to generate a data set, you need to specify first the population, uh, the user or site you want to base your features on. And most importantly, in which point in time, meaning the prediction point. And I think this concept is best explained by an example. Let's say I'm working on the premium prediction task. Actually, this is the onboarding task for all data scientists joining uh, here uh, at Wix, doing premium prediction. And I have a labeled list of users who have upgraded uh, at, um, when they upgraded? Oh, uh, upgraded from September to October of the previous year. So I want to get the values of the feature as they are today, during training time. Why? Because I know that the users have already upgraded. I have a target leakage. I want to get the values of the users as they appeared on August or July or, or June, depending on my prediction point, where do I, when, at which time I want to predict. So in, in some sense, the feature store acts like a time machine. I want to see the world as it was in this specific point in time. And we can move the needle uh, for each and every user or site individually. You don't have to choose one specific uh, hard point in time. You can do it for each and every user individually. The idea, the basic idea, is Preventing target leakages, built-in prevention of target leakage in the offline feature store. It's really the, the concept the offline feature store is built around. And in the serving flow, this is where it gets uh, more complicated. One of the hardest problems in using, deploying machine learning models to production setting is feature gathering, feature extraction. And why is that? Usually models are trained on analytical data, the following multiple phases of digestion and aggregation, the data warehouse level, and probably using SQL, the de facto language of data. On the other hand, conversely, features in production should be extracted and calculated, usually from production APIs modeled with a general purpose programming language. And as we learned the hard way, of course, this discrepancy is very problematic. Let's say, for example, uh, one of our models is using 50 features in production, not, not something out of the ordinary. So now that the model is in production, the poor engineer that wants to interact with it should take a look at potentially thousands of lines of SQL and understand exactly which production APIs does he need to scrape in order to get the data uh, the data scientist trained his model on. And more specifically, he needs to uh, build the logic of his features exactly like the data scientist uh, modeled them. More often than not, implementations differ, leading to what is called a training serving skew, the difference of performance between models during training and during serving. 
In addition, think about how much this couples a model builder, data scientist, and model invoker, the engineer. Every change or addition the data scientist would want to do in one of his features requires an integration effort uh, from the engineer, really killing velocity on both ends. And we attack it using a rather straightforward approach, single feature definition. Feature definition is modeled in protobuf, as you can see here. And every feature created via the feature store is an instance, or is an instance of this message or class. It has a name, a measure, the set of events, the list of events the feature is based on, and the entity identifier it refers to. UUID or MSID is user or site. And we distinguish between very two different tracks. For training purposes, uh, we need to generate a, a batch data set. Data set for the, uh, the uh, batch prediction, meaning a large data set that the model will be trained on. Okay, and this latency is usually not a big problem. These things, depending on the size of the table I need to generate, it can take four minutes uh, to hours, and, and that's okay sometimes. Sometimes not, but sometimes it is. And the serving flow is a different deal altogether. Uh, usually, models are triggered on a per user or per site basis, meaning that I need to generate just one feature vector. And latency is a big issue. In some production use cases, uh, I need to render the feature, I need to extract the features within milliseconds. And the idea here is to solve the implementation, di the implementation difference only once. On, or more accurately, only once per feature family, because these feature families don't vary too much. So let's look, uh, let's dive a bit deeper into the implementation of what we just saw, uh, meaning the feature store. Flow, we generate Spark SQL, which, gener uh, which interacts with the data warehouse layer of the platform. As mentioned before, the process is responsible for generating a very big, large, uh, wide table uh, of features. In this serving flow, we have a real-time feature extraction service, which is responsible for generating onto the serving flow. And this service is more of an orchestrator, uh, with each feature family has an implementation of its own. Specifically, I'd like to focus on the clickstream events, online and offline implementation, which cover both uh, aggregations and categorical. Features that are based on clickstream amount to uh, more than uh, 90 percent of the features that are currently uh, have that we currently have in the feature store and I think engineering wise they represent the most interesting flow. Training world is rather straightforward. Clickstream events are eventually saved as parquet files on S3. Data info 101. And this is part of our uh, data platform infrastructure which predated uh, the ML platform by years. So this is in, in some sense a given. And the parquet files are partitioned by business unit and then date. Why is that? Because usually analysis of data at Wix is confined to one business unit and over a well-defined range of time. Analysts at the editor segment usually don't query uh, much events from the restaurants or, or booking, booking company uh, business units. And the Spark application, which generates uh, the training sets, interacts with these files directly. So we have no problem here. But this poses a very hard problem for the serving flow. Why is that? Because we need a fast by user access to the user's history. If we want to do that fast uh, feature extraction mechanism, not a by business unit or date, specifically not as parquet files on S3. It's really not the right format. So the first action we perform in order to solve this flow in the serving flow is to pivot the data, pivot and aggregate the data for all of the user's history relevant to some features and append it to a big, all-inclusive key-value store. First, we pivot the data. Then, uh, once, we, uh, once the system detects that the user is currently active, currently engaged in Wix in some form, we load its history uh, into a smaller, much faster cache, also a key-value store. And the key premise, the assumption we based our solution on, is that the number of, uh, number of currently active users at Wix is just a small fraction of all the registered users we have uh, at Wix. I think 150, 160 million users. And finally, we continuously update the cache values from the real-time data stream of the user, giving us a real-time data freshness for the serving flow, for the online, exactly what we wanted. And let's look at this uh, process from a components, engineering point of view. 
So first we have the daily build pivoting phase. Mentioned before, the data in S3 is, par is partitioned by business unit and then that we need it by user. And the big key value store uh, which we use is Apache HBase, part of the Hadoop ecosystem. And this is a batch process that can take uh, from, uh, some time, from minutes to hours. Once we recognize the user is currently active, the warm-up flow is triggered. We load the user's history from the offline store, from HBase, to a smaller and much faster cache, to Redis. This process can take a few seconds. And finally, uh, for each event coming in from the user, we update, it, we update the cache itself, the cache values themselves. Uh, and the system that is currently being used is Apache Storm, a legacy system. There's no short of alternatives. The final piece of the puzzle is the data scientist interface for this feature calculation process. We have a, a mock model class inheriting from our base Wix model. Let's look at the implementation of the schema method, a method that should describe the model interface, meaning, again, which input features it gets and the output prediction fields it produces. Let's focus on the input schema and more specifically on the features. And this is the killer feature of the platform the basis for its very existence. The data scientists need to type in the name of the feature he just created in the feature store, count save site last week, and mark it as auto-extracted. And that's it. The platform itself is responsible for generating and injecting the feature for him during serving. So if our beloved data scientist wakes up one day and decides to change a uh, uh, set, set of 50 features into another set, 50, 100, 200 features, he can do the entire thing by himself. He doesn't need to communicate this change to anyone. Ideally, if all the features can be auto-extracted, all model invokers should just say, I want for this user or site, give me this, uh, run me this model, churn, premium, whatever. All the feature extraction logic is managed by the platform and controlled, uh, and, and controlled by the data scientist using this mechanism, the schema method. And this part neatly ties the entire platform together, from feature creation and data set generation, to model schema registration on build time, and feature extraction in production. Probably my favorite part uh, of the project. And let's do a recap of what we saw, left to right. First, we have the offline feature store, single discoverable source of truth for feature to be used by model based on the notion of a single feature definition. Next up, we have the model CI, model repository and CI system, based primarily on MLflow, uh, specifically MLflow projects component. Above that, uh, our in-house management console, data scientist control plane, central place, data scientist manages features, data sets, and models. And over to a centralized prediction service, which acts as a gateway to, to a gateway to ML models that are actually deployed on SageMaker. Having a prediction, centralized prediction service gives us one, API layer, two, a health dashboard, three, automatic feature extraction, so, again, the mechanism we just saw, and fourth, standardized uh, logging of features and predictions. Key lessons we learned. First, software engineering practices don't always play well with ML. The internet of full, uh, is full with articles around that issue, which I think I read most of, but still managed uh, to fall into this pit. Uh, the naive notion of doing a build on push is especially problematic from what we saw. Uh, the training process is something that ideally the data scientists would like much more control of. Checking parameters, running multiple uh, builds in parallel, debugging builds, meantime, things like that. Second, data management for uh, online, meaning the, the online versus offline difference is an especially hard problem, engineering-wise. How do you bridge that gap when you have, uh, when the events, uh, when features are not based on events, where you have no notion uh, of a point in time? This continues to be one of our main focus points while we're building this platform. And third, model monitoring, having a good way of monitoring model KPIs in production. In a lot of the cases, you deploy the model to production only to realize, to be disappointed, that our, the, its performance is way below what we expect and see on the test set. And understanding why, which is not trivial at all, is key. 
Maybe some feature is misbehaving, or, or the data set that I'm getting, or the features that I'm getting in production bear different statistical properties from what the model was originally trained on, i.e. concept drift. There can be many reasons. And having a good way to visualize and detect them is something we are putting much more effort into. So hopefully uh, this overview gave you a better understanding of what problems an ML platform is trying to solve and how we address them here at Wix. Thank you.